I think uh, really the importance of this session is to remind us uh, that we stand on uh, the shoulders of giants when it comes to our movement, uh, and in particular theoretical giants, people like Marx and Lenin and Trotsky, of course. And today we're going to, of course, be adding to that the name of Frederick Engels, whose 200th birthday it is next month on the 28th of November. And uh, um, Engels, really, it's, un it's unfortunate that his contribution often gets overlooked, actually, because uh, he lived both in life and, well, and in death afterwards as well, really in the shadow of uh, his lifelong friend and collaborator, Karl Marx, who was undeniably uh, a genius. And in this respect, Engels is often considered as playing a kind of second fiddle to Marx. And in fact, Engels himself was a very modest, humble man, and uh, he actually often kind of uh, promoted this idea himself. He said, for example, uh, I'll just read what uh, this is a, a, a speech Engels gave after uh, Marx's death. He said, what I contributed at any rate, with the exception of my work in a few special fields, Marx could very well have done without me. What Marx accomplished, I would not have achieved. Marx was a genius. We others were at best men of talent. Without him, the theory would be far from where it is today. It therefore rightly bears his name. But I think despite Engels' uh, apparent modesty, um, what you'll find is, in fact, he himself was also a theoretical giant, and not just in a few special fields, as he says. In fact, Engels himself was actually a genuine polymath, really. He was he had a man with an encyclopedic mind, and you can see this from his writings. You see it uh, on his writings in economy, on philosophy, on history, but also wide-ranging topics from science to literature and even military writings. And most importantly, we see that it was really thanks to Engels that together with Marx, they were able to lay the theoretical foundations for the movement that we are involved in today, the revolutionary workers movement, the movement for socialism internationally. They helped to lay the scientific socialist ideas that were so key to the development of this movement. But also, they always tried to link these to the real movements of the working class that were going on around them. And they threw themselves into trying to build a revolutionary organization worthy of, uh, of this name. They started with the Communist League, uh, but later on tried to form the First International, and then later on helped to establish the German Social Democracy. And after uh, Marx's death, Engels was also involved in the founding of the Second International. Now, it's very fashionable these days to uh, try and slander Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky. Engels himself is often painted as just some sort of philanthropic benefactor to Marx. Now, it's true that his financial contributions to, to Marx and his family were pivotal, actually, in helping to... Um, support Marx, enable him to actually dedicate his time to writing. Uh, but I think if you look at Engels' own writings, you'll see that his role was primarily a political and a theoretical one, not a financial one. That was really a secondary role. Others have tried to exaggerate differences between Marx and Engels. Often uh, you'll hear things like Marx is just a kind of liberal academic and it was Engels who kind of was the revolutionary firebrand. Others try to say that Marx was the, uh, the economist and Engels kind of was this uh, kind of uh, fruity philosopher who invented terms like dialectical materialism. But this is completely false. Marx, uh, you can see, uses the method of dialectical materialism throughout all of his works. And in fact, uh, Engels' philosophical writings, things like anti-during, were checked over by Marx. And uh, vice versa, Engels also helped introduce Marx to economic ideas. So there was really no separation between the two. Uh, they were both dedicated revolutionaries. What you will see is that both get slandered, obviously, for giving uh, birth to uh, the ideas supposedly that led to Stalin and Mao and all this kind of nonsense. This is what you find in biographies like the one by Tristram Hunt, the the the, um, uh, the frock coated communist. Uh, he, he calls his biography, trying to you know trying to implicate uh, Engels as just being this kind of man of leisure, going about drinking and hunting. 
which uh, of course Engels did like the, the the finer things in life, but the important thing was he dedicated himself to the struggle of the working class. And really, it's kind of quite rich for these criticisms to come from someone like Tristram Hunt, who was parachuted into his seat as a Labour MP in Stoke, and later went and, and now abandoned that position to become head of the Victorian Albert Museum, £200,000 a year salary, and he's actually firing the lowest paid workers there as we speak. Anyway, that aside, it's our job now to really scrape away all of this mud that's been slugging at Engels and uncover his real revolutionary uh, role that he played in developing the movement. Now I want to focus in this respect on Engels' ideas, that's the title of the talk, Revolutionary Ideas of Engels, but just a little bit on his life. He was born, as I said, to almost 200 years ago on the 28th of November 1820 into a bourgeois family, uh, a very conservative family in Germany in the Rhineland province in a, in a town called Barmen. And he was quite a rebellious youth uh, from a, a young age. And his father, who wanted him to kind of go and work in the in the family business, sent him off to do an apprenticeship in a town called Bremen. And later on, he went to do uh, military service in the Prussian army in 1841. That's where he ended up in Berlin. And it was in Berlin that he became more involved in political activity. Uh, in particular, he attended the lectures at University of Berlin uh, of, uh, of, of uh, philosophy lectures. Uh, and, and it was here in the University of Berlin that you had a movement, a uh, very uh, prominent movement called the Young Hegelians. Now, these were a kind of group of radical liberals uh, who were kind of looking for ideas that, that could challenge the kind of autocracy of the Prussian regime. And they, they, they started to, to grasp towards the dialectical ideas of Hegel, the, Germ the great German dialectical philosopher, who'd actually been a lecturer at the University of Berlin uh, just before. And uh, the young Hegelians were this kind of radical liberal movement, as I say. It was also here that Engels started writing for a paper called the Rheinische Zeitung, uh, which was uh, actually edited by Marx. And that's how the two of them first became acquainted. On his way to Manchester to work uh, in his family business in 1842, uh, he popped in to see Marx along the way. And uh, actually the two didn't get along initially because uh, Marx uh, thought that Hegel was still attached to the young Hegelians. Marx was moving away from this kind of philosophical idealist group uh, of intellectuals and uh, academic critics and was looking for a more revolutionary uh, philosophy. Engels was too, but Marx didn't realise it. Thankfully, later on in 1845, on the way back from Manchester, Engels popped in to see Marx again, this time in Paris, and the two of them collaborated to, to produce a polemic against the young Hegelians, particularly uh, their leading figures around uh, the Bauer brothers. And this is what became known as the Holy Family also known as uh, a critique of critical criticism because what they were critiquing was this very academic criticism that came from the young Hegelians, similar to kind of what we were discussing earlier this morning in terms of academic Marxism, very divorced from the struggles of the working class, very idealistic, and Engels and Marx were moving away from this and started to develop a philosophy more based on materialism and based on the working class. Now, it's important at this point, I think, to underline what do we mean by idealism and uh, materialism. Idealism, uh, sorry, materialism, first of all, we should say, is the philosophy that asserts that the material world is primary. The material world of matter, of nature, of society that we see around us is real and, foot and primary, and it is governed by objective laws and processes. And these objective laws and processes can be known to us, can be discovered and understood by interacting with the world around us, by interacting with the world through investigation, experimentation, science, we uncover the laws of nature and uh, uncover the, the objective reality of the material world we live in. The world of ideas is not a separate world of ideas. Ideas are, for, in, in a materialist sense, are a reflection, are, are approximation, are generalization of the material world, the ideas that we see around us. And similarly, uh, with uh, ideologies and so forth. Idealism, on the other hand, says the, the opposite. He says that, says that there is a separate world of ideas that is primary. You know, you've got, you've got Plato's idea of the cave uh, with the, the ideas, the forms that exist in a kind of separate realm and everything that we see on Earth is apparently just some sort of imperfect uh, kind of version of a perfect form existing somewhere else. 
And this kind of idealism is what is then the basis for religion, for spirituality, and even, I would say today, the, the kind of postmodernism that we see uh, infecting uh, a lot of the, the, the left in the universities, with, where everything is determined by uh, narratives and uh, stories and uh, discourses. And that's similar, really, to the idealism of the past, uh, which puts ideas and ideology primarily above all else, rather than material conditions. And uh, idealism, mm -hmm. in this sense, it's, it's, it's looking for to recourse to, to gods and spirits to explain the world, rather than investigating the world itself. And the Enlightenment thinkers, um, and, uh, uh, and the Enlightenment thinkers before Marx and Engels were attempting to break with this religious idealism and were trying to develop philosophies based on rationalism and empiricism, on science. Now, on the other hand, as I said, you had Hegel, who was this dialectical philosopher, trying to resurrect the ideas of dialectics that had originally come about actually in ancient Greece, around a man called Heraclitus. He was a kind of mysterious figure who talked in aphorisms, and he, uh, he, he had all these kind of phrases like, um, everything is and is not, because everything is in flux, and you cannot step into the same river twice. These are the kind of, uh, kind of uh, dialectical ideas that Heraclitus introduced. And what he was grasping at, really, is the idea that the world around us is not something rigid and static. Things do not exist in isolation, but they are interconnected, and they're part of processes of motion, of change, of flux, as you say. And that fundamentally, um, things are, uh, are, are driven forward by tension and contradiction, rather than the world of formal logic, which seeks to try and absolve contradiction uh, from the world, uh, rather in dialectics, we see contradiction as something inherent within all processes driving motion forwards. In fact, as, uh, as Hegel and later Engels point out, change and motion themselves are a contradiction in the sense that things both are something and are something else. They are um, both uh, here and there at the same time. That in itself is a contradiction, if you like. And Engels was trying to develop these dialectical ideas with his logic. But the problem with uh, Hegel's uh, philosophy of dialectics was that for him it was a very idealistic philosophy. He based his dialectics on idealism in the sense that he saw the laws of dialectics as existing separate from the world, He's as governed by some sort of absolute spirit he saw it, rather than seeing dialectics as something within the world, as something kind of arising out of the real material world, the real interactions. And this is where uh, Marx and Engels come in, because they try to, again, resurrect these ideas of dialectics, but on a materialist basis. In their words, they had to take Hegel and turn him on his head. In other words, take dialectics and put it on a materialist basis by explaining that the laws of change are generalizations of real processes taking place in the world around us. They are, they are laws that arise out of the complex, dynamic interactions of matter in motion, not laws that are imposed upon it. Now, they took this philosophy of dialectical materialism and then applied it to history, uh, particularly with their other collaborative work, the German ideology, which is not published in their lifetime, but it's a, a great exposition of uh, historical materialism, because the point for them was that there was no sharp dividing line between the natural world and the historical world, or the world of society and, and the economy and human thought. Just as processes could be examined in nature scientifically, so too history and the economy could be uh, scientifically understood, as well as obviously the development of ideas themselves. Now, it's therefore on this basis of dialectical materialism, historical materialism, and of course Marxist economics, the application of these ideas uh, to the current economic system we live under, that we get the fundamental basis then of Marxism or scientific socialism as Marx and Engels named it. And this is what really helped them to develop a kind of a fully rounded framework, breaking away from the young Hegelians, breaking away also from people like Feuerbach, who had kind of tried to move away from the idealism of Hegel, but not quite leapt to that revolutionary materialism that Marx and Engels had arrived at. And this is really what Marx meant with his thesis on Feuerbach when he said, the philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. It wasn't enough just to have a philosophy looking and examining the world. It was necessary to understand the world in order to actively try and change it. 
and that really was the big break that Marx and Engels made with their predecessors. And importantly in this respect, Marx and Engels tried to connect the ideas to the real movements and, 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 and events taking place around them. And Engels' experience in Manchester were very key in this respect because he observed at close quarters the living conditions, the working conditions of the working class. And from his observations, which he wrote up into a pamphlet called The Conditions of the Working Class in England, he drew very revolutionary conclusions. And what he, what he realised was that it was the social conditions of the working class that gave them the potential for revolutionary class consciousness. In other words, the, the, the conditions of exploitation by the bosses that forced workers to come together to form trade unions and their ability to withdraw their labour, to go on strike, to form political parties as well. Ultimately, all of this uh, kind of collective consciousness that the working class uh, has because of uh, the, their objective material conditions in relation to production, it was this that gave the working class the potential to be a revolutionary agent of change, Engels noted. And uh, in this respect, uh, he, this is where he notified Marx really the importance, this is where Marx was alerted to the importance really of the working class as the potential grave diggers of capitalism, the proletariat. This is really uh, the, the, the key uh, lesson to be drawn from Engels' experience in Manchester. However, in Manchester, he also came across political economy, the ideas of, of Adam Smith, of David Ricardo, these English, uh, British, Enlightenment thinkers. They were bourgeois liberals, but they were trying to at least understand capitalism scientifically. And uh, in this respect, uh, again, uh, Engels alerted Marx to the importance of these thinkers, the, the, these people trying to analyse capitalism and, and, and treat economics as a science. And Marx subsequently tried to do the same himself, but again, from the perspective of the working class and the struggle for socialism. So again, we can see it's a complete myth to portray Marx as the economist and Engels as the philosopher, because actually, at this point, it was the other way around. Marx was writing his philosophical manuscripts, and it was Engels who was writing more on economics. And the two were really inseparable, sharing these ideas to come up with the framework of scientific socialism. It was also in Manchester that Engels came in touch with the uh, Chartist movement, which we heard about last night, this revolutionary movement of the nascent working class in Britain. And he actually put the Chartist leaders in touch with the leaders of uh, a group called the League of the Just, who are a group of German revolutionary emigres with, an, with a headquarters in London. And Engels had uh, met these people in 1843, described them as the first revolutionary proletarians he'd met in uh, Britain. And uh, Marx and Engels from this point threw themselves into the League of the Just, seeing the potential here for a, 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 a new movement, a socialist movement, a workers' movement. And uh, for this reason, in the summer of 1847, the, at the first Congress of the League of the Just, they actually convinced the League to change their name from this kind of superhero sounding uh, organization, you know, the Justice League. The, the League of the Just were changed to the Communist League, a much more fitting name. And later, at the second Congress in November, December of 1847, Marx and Engels were commissioned to write a programmatic document for this uh, new Communist League to outline its uh, program, its demands. And Engels initially drafted this. It was called The Principles of Communism. And it's basically a kind of FAQ of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of scientific socialism, going through all the common accusations against communism, uh, replying in, in very, deep, you know, very uh, concise uh, answers about the myths of Marxism, effectively similar to, to what you can find on socialist.net and marxist.com today. Uh, these very concise answers, uh, you know, saying what is the working class? What would socialism look like? Why does capitalism go into crisis? What was the historic role of capitalism? What's its uh, redundancy, its obsolescence now? All of these things uh, were answered in this and eventually written up into what became really the most famous collaboration between Marx and Engels, which is, of course, the Communist Manifesto. And uh, this obviously ended with the famous call to arms, workers of all countries unite. Now, the manifesto would prove to be extremely prophetic, actually, uh, because it was uh, in 1848, just months after the, the manifesto was written and published, that you had uh, revolutions breaking out across the whole of Europe. 
and uh, and you and it was these kind of events you see that th these events shaped Marx and Engels and their ideas and in fact Marx and Engels in many respects were a product of their time they were alive to see the Chartist movement rising up the revolutions across Europe in 1848 to 51 and of course the Paris Commune which was this marvelous inspiring event that they drew many lessons from and this is the important thing for Marx and Engels, that their ideas were always based on these real experiences, their lessons, the theory they developed. Someone asked the question earlier this morning, what is theory? And it was pointed out theory is the, is the concentrated experience of the class struggle. That's what they were doing, writing down the generalized lessons of these events that could be applied by the revolutionary movement to, to, to try and uh, help it and, and be successful in its aims. And the real conclusion they drew was the need for an international socialist movement based on a clear revolutionary uh, scientific socialist program. And this is what they dedicated their life to trying to achieve, to trying to bring political clarity to the movement. And in this respect, you see that for decades they were involved in constant correspondence with the leading political figures, socialist groups, various uh, thinkers and so forth from across the world, trying to uh, kind of debate with them, discuss with them and clarify these ideas, educate the movement in the importance of scientific socialism. At the same time, they weren't sectarian. They weren't. Uh, they didn't just hold their noses up to to, to these groups. They said, actually, uh, Marx pointed out in his critique of the Gotha program. He said every step of real movement is more important than a dozen programs. In this respect, they saw the launch of the uh, International Working Men's Association, otherwise known as the First International, which was launched in 1864. They saw this as a massive step forward. Despite its very political, heterogeneous character, it was uh, a mixture of prudenists and utopians and all sorts of trade unionists and figures. It was very confused politically, but Marx and Engels became its leading theoretical figures, tried to clarify the program of the international and uh, engaged in debates and discussions in order to try to do so, always in a patient way, as Marx said, you wanted to be mild in manner but bold in content. Nevertheless, uh, their efforts were really scuppered by the uh, intrigues of Bakunin and the anarchists who accused Engels and Marx of authoritarianism. In other words, really they didn't like the fact that the, 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 that the anarchists were in a minority and couldn't convince the majority, so they went around saying everything was authoritarian. Engels answered these arguments actually in an excellent essay called On Authority. Fortunately, I don't have time to really go into that. But unfortunately, because of uh, the defeat of the Paris Commune, the, the turn in the class struggle, and the intrigues of the anarchists, the international was wrapped up soon after 1871. But in this sense, Marx and Engels, as I say, they tried to develop the real movement and develop theory. This was really, for them, the key goal, develop theory. For Marx, that primarily meant his magnum opus, Capital, which again, Engels played a pivotal role in, actually. Although Engels was based up in Manchester at the time, he read and reviewed every page that Marx wrote on Capital and uh, sent it back with his comments. So again, uh, heavily evolved in the economic side of things. And in fact, after Marx's death, because Engels was the, the, the one most uh, acquainted with the ideas and also most acquainted with uh, Marx's indecipherable handwriting, it was actually Engels who had to uh, dedicate, sacrifice himself to uh, writing down, uh, all of, you know, getting together all of Marx's assorted notes and handbooks and manuscripts in order to publish volumes two and three of Capital, which again is an enormous uh, kind of um, uh, achievement that, it, that without Engels' efforts would not have been possible. Only Engels could have done that. And Engels, during this whole time, as I said, he made enormous sacrifices. He was living up in Manchester, working in this factory, in his family business. He hated it, but he did it in order to be able to provide Marx and his family with the funds so that they could dedicate themselves to writing while they were living in poverty and squalor in Soho. Marx trekking back and forth to the British Library, reading reports, trying to get this, uh, this book together. And all of this correspondence, all of this building of the First International, all of this writing of capital, it meant that Engels' time was incredibly busy. And his main writings therefore come later in life. And uh, at the same time, once he finally did start publishing some, some big works, that you can see how important these works were. The key classic Marxist texts that any aspiring revolutionary should read. And possibly of greatest importance is anti-during, 
Now, Turing was a arrogant academic philosopher who had written his own grand theory, uh, which he considered to be a rebuttal of Marxism. And his kind of academic, uh, idealistic, reformist uh, scribblings, they gained a certain echo amongst a layer of the German social democracy, particularly the youth. Again, similar to the kind of postmodernists and the academics that we discussed earlier today. Uh, but in this respect, Marx felt it was necessary to respond to Dürer. He was busy with capital, and so he passed the buck on to Engels, who uh, I don't think was particularly keen to do it, but he did it. And he used the opportunity to outline brilliantly uh, the ideas, the fundamental principles of Marxism, of scientific socialism. In fact, Enter Turing, I'd say, is one of the, the best uh, kind of writings you can find that summarizes Marxism in one place. And uh, above all, it's a great exposition of uh, the laws of dialectics, which Engels summarizes in this book as such. He says, the laws of dialectics are nothing more than the science of the general laws of motion and development of nature, of human society and thought. That's a pretty, uh, pretty bold claim. But he pointed out that these are not idealistic laws, as I said earlier. This isn't like the Hegelian view where dialectical laws exist separate from the rest of the world. No, Engels goes on to say, there can be no question of building the laws of dialectics into nature, but of discovering them in it and evolving them from it. So what are these laws of dialectics? Well, uh, the most fundamental of these laws uh, is uh, the transformation of quantity and quality, uh, a, descript a general description, really, of how change occurs. Because it's not enough to just say everything changes, because when we look around the world, we can see everything isn't changing all the time. There's relative stasis uh, interspersed with periods of rapid change. And this is what Engels meant by the transformation of quantity into quality, the idea that you get a gradual accumulation of small changes, quantitative changes beneath the surface within processes that go unnoticed and then burst to the surface at a certain point, a tipping point, when suddenly you have a transformation of quality, a phase change, if you like. And in fact, Engels uses the example of uh, water in, in anti during to explain this. He says, look, water doesn't just uh, change gradually in its composition. Rather, it, it starts as ice uh, at sub-zero temperatures. At zero degrees, it suddenly all becomes uh, water and melts. And then you have a gradual increase in temperature until another turning point is reached at the boiling point, 100 degrees, when suddenly you have this phase change from liquid into gas. But again, for Marx and Engels, there was no iron wall separating nature from the rest of the world, from society. And therefore, this idea of quantity and quality can equally be seen and applied to uh, history and to the economy. You see it in history and consciousness in revolutions. What are revolutions, if not a tipping point where the, the gradual accumulation of discontent and anger breaks out into the surface in these uh, massive uh, societal uh, transformations? Similarly, with uh, economic crises, the, the contradictions build up within uh, capitalism and then some sort of trigger, like the pandemic, for example, suddenly bursts these things to the surface again. Engels highlights that the same happens in science and thought itself, actually, in the sense that you have in science a build up an accumulation of errors that, that contradict theories and at a certain point leads to the need for a paradigm shift or a scientific revolution, as Thomas Kuhn uh, called it. And uh, this highlights another law of dialectics, the negation of the negation. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's look at this example of, of theory. You can see that when a, scientific, a new scientific theory comes about, it doesn't simply cancel what came before. It doesn't simply abolish the old theory. Rather, it absorbs all that is correct within that theory and takes it to a higher level, often by having to transform it into its opposite, but not in a, in a pure cancellation way. And through this process of, uh, of paradigm shifts, you, you see a spiral, an upward spiral of human knowledge and development of science uh, are constantly being taken to a higher and higher level. You can see this with the example of light in science, for example, how Newton uh, had first come up uh, with a, a particle theory of light, the corpuscular theory of light, saying that light was composed of these little corpuscules or particles. And this was dominant for about 100 years until Huygens came along with the wave theory of light in order to explain certain phenomena like diffraction. 
And then you fast forward to the early 20th century and Einstein comes along and says, actually, I've discovered the photon, which shows both properties of particles and waves. So light is actually both. And you can see how these theories build upon each other, coming to a higher level, incorporating everything of the old, but uh, radically transforming and uh, advancing human knowledge. Now, Engels really applied this idea also to human society itself. And that was the, the case in one of his most famous works called The Origins of the Family, Private Property, and the state. And in this book, Engels used the most recent anthropological evidence of his time to show how class society had developed out of what he called primitive communism. And that was because of changes in the material conditions of production. What you had was uh, a process known as the Neolithic Revolution, uh, a revolution in agriculture and uh, the, the, the rearing of, uh, of animals. Uh, and this led to the first time in society of a production of a surplus. And on the basis of a surplus, you get the development of class society, because now with the production of a surplus, a certain layer, an elite, are freed from manual labor and can dedicate themselves to the advancement of science and technology and, uh, and mathematics, philosophy and so forth. And actually, Aristotle pointed this out himself in, uh, as, a, as someone who benefited from this process in uh, slave society, ancient Greece. He said, man can only philosophize and think once he can eat. And this is the case. It's, it's the material conditions, the changes in production that give rise to the ability to actually take society forwards through science and philosophy. In this way, actually, Hegel pointed out that it's not so much from slavery that mankind is originally liberated, but through it. It's actually only on the basis of this brutal exploitation that you actually see the development of science and technology, the progress of, of mathematics and, uh, and art and culture of the ancient period. And uh, at the same time, Engels shows in this uh, writings of his that it was, only, it was actually uh, because of class society and in particular private property that you end up with the, you, you see the beginnings of the oppression of women. There was no oppression of women in early primitive communism. Uh, they were considered equals uh, to, to men in every respect. And it's only with the emergence of private property and inheritance and the, the attempt for men to, to know who their inheritors are, to pass on their surplus, pass on their property, that you see the beginnings of nuclear families, of monogamy and of the oppression of women. I don't have time to go more into that, but hopefully someone in the discussion can, uh, can, can develop this uh, point earlier. The point is for Engels that he said that we want to return to a communistic society, one free of classes, of private property and of oppression, but obviously at a higher level, not on a primitive communism, but if you like a fully luxury automated communism based on superabundance, not scarcity. And in this respect, capitalism has paved the way for this. It's created the conditions, the material conditions for this. This is why Marx and Engels called themselves scientific socialism, uh, socialists. They were materialists who understood that socialism required this superabundance in order to come about. And Engels explains this brilliantly in Anti-During and in the, the redacted version, or the, 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 the reduced version, sorry, the editor's cut uh, known as socialism utop utopian and scientific where he shows how capitalism has developed an immense level of planning within these firms. And at the same time, there's this huge antagonism between that socialized production, that planning that goes on within companies, within these giant monopolies that have negated free competition. Competition has turned into concentration and monopoly. But it's created this planning. And the task now is to, is to get rid of this antagonism between that and the private ownership uh, that means that the fruits of all of this go to the elites, to the ruling class, to the capitalists. We want, obviously, all this production and technology to be used for the needs of society, not the profits of the few. Now, all of this explains also uh, a third law of dialectics that uh, or highlights a third law of dialectics that Engels uh, noted. Which is, to, which is that of the unity and interaction of opposites. Now, what he means by that is the idea that phenomena, processes, they're never purely one-sided. All opposites always exist alongside each other in, 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 uh, in opposition to each other and in, in, in relation to one another. And that things, when pushed to their extremes, can actually transform into their opposites. 
And Engels highlights this again in anti during in relation to this idea of science and theories, pointing out that general truths, general scientific knowledge, if you push it beyond its applicability, they can always become uh, an absurdity and, uh, and, and become uh, fallacious. And uh, in that respect, you know, you can see uh, that with, again, the development of science, you know, theories always reach their limits and become errors at a certain point. And you need, again, as I said, this negation of the negation to take theories and science to a higher level. But the other side of the coin is that even uh, uh, even very elementary ideas can have a practical ap application within certain limits. Formal logic is clearly not true uh, in all times and all places, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it gets us by, right? Things generally are the same from one day to the next, and that's the, really the material basis in the world around us. That relative calm that we occasionally experience is the basis for formal logic and for a lot of idealism. And um, But in the relation to this idea of the unity of opposites, Engels highlights that all these concepts that we think of as pure kind of divorced opposites are in fact uh, interrelated and part of a, of a unity, of an inter interaction. And in particular, he, re he describes this in relation to things like the general and the particular, or the abstract and the concrete, or the, uh, the part and the whole. These are all similar concepts which try and explain the fact that for us, dialectics is about, yes, drawing out the general laws, the general processes, but then try having to obviously apply these to the concrete situation. The truth ultimately is concrete. So we have to take our theories, including dialectics, which are these generalized expressions of the things we see around us, the processes we see around us, but then apply them to the real world. You see that in the development of philosophy itself, Engels points out. You have initially uh, the very general philosophy of, of, of the ancients, but then it required the enlightenment and the, the scientific method to delve deeper into these specific fields, uncover more, and now what's needed is to bring these things back together again under one general framework. And it's very important to have this framework, this generalized theory, because at the end of the day, this is what gives us uh, kind of, as I said, the foresight over astonishment. It can, it's what can help us guide our investigations. It's very important to have a philosophy. If you don't have a general philosophy, a framework, an analytical set of tools, then you just absorb the prejudices and uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the ideas of the ruling class, which are obviously the dominant ideas in any society. And what you see in, in, in is actually Engels applies this idea of the need for a scientific, philosophical, uh, dialectical method. He applies this um, in, in a remarkable way in his other great work, The Dialectics of Nature, which is actually a collection of unfinished essays. He never finished this work of his. But by applying a dialectical and materialist analysis, he was able to explain many of the unresolved kind of scientific questions of his day and, and delve deeper into these scientific mysteries. And in fact, he brilliantly anticipates many of the problems that modern science faces. For example, in modern physics, cosmology, you've got ideas like dark matter and dark energy, these completely nonsensical ideas bound by, you know, bouncing around because as, as our scientists stumble to try and find the, the solution to the mysteries of the universe. And in doing so, all sorts of weird and wonderful theories developed along the way, like string theory, completely unprovable uh, theories. Engels actually anticipated a lot of these discussions with uh, his writings on uh, matter and motion and time and space, showing how all these things were interconnected. And in particular, he talks about infinity, the concept of infinity, how you, the, the universe is infinite in time and space. And it's ridiculous to talk about a beginning of time, i.e. a Big Bang, which again is one of these mysteries that still remains unresolved today which Engels uh, gave an enormous insight into with his writings. So again, we could learn a lot from going back and, and reading Engels from over 100, uh, well, 140 or 30 years ago. Now, what's most notable, actually, is his essay within this co uh, collection of essays uh, called A Part Play by Labour, The Part Play by Labour, From Ape to Man. Uh, and the transition, sorry, in the transition from ape to man, I should say. Because what Engels did here was apply this materialist analysis, this dialectical analysis, to the evolution of mankind itself. The, pointing out that the thing that really separated out us from our early ancestors, you know, what our early ancestors had in uniquely different from the rest of the animal kingdom, was not uh, mir a miraculously large brain and super intelligence that separated them out. Rather, Engels points out, the big brain was the product 
of labor actually and it was the ultimately the bipedal stance the the upright stance of our early ancestors coming down from the trees that freed up the hands enabled tools to be developed enable our early ancestors to interact with the world around us and it was this interaction this labor that ultimately led to the development of of abstract thinking of complex thought of of higher levels of consciousness and in turn also social production, the need to produce together collectively, it was what gave an impetus to the development of language, which further gave a development, uh, an impetus to the development of abstract thinking and complex thought, of memory, of planning, all of these sorts of things, of societal knowledge passed down from one generation to the next. Engels says in this respect it was, it was labor and language that were the real stimuluses to the development of the brain. And this was actually proven subsequently, after, long after Engels' death, by the discovery of the fossil records showing that our early ancestors begin, yes, with an upright stance and with the development of tools. And it's only much later on that you see a much larger brain size developing. In other words, the brain is the product of labor, not some idealistic, just superhuman brain that developed out of nowhere. And in, again, this shows the advantage of foresight over astonishment of theory. Stephen Jay Gould, one, uh, a, a more modern evolutionary biologist, passed away many years ago. He pointed out actually that Engels uh, was right in all of this and that modern science could have learned a lot if they'd read Engels a bit sooner. Now, for us also, it's very important had to have this uh, theoretical framework, as I say, not just to analyze science, but to understand how uh, history moves, why crises occur, how revolutions take place, and how consciousness changes. And this brings uh, me to a, another key aspect of dialectics that Engels explained, which is the relationship between necessity, accident, and cause. So Engels points out that there's not uh, a kind of de uh, a mechanical determinism in, uh, in, in the world. We're materialists. We understand that material conditions create ideas, create the superstructure in society, but not in this mechanical way. Not, and there's no fatalism in history. Um, but uh, what you can see, Engels points out, is that accident uh, is a reflection of necessity. This is a Hegelian idea that Engels took, put on a materialist basis. In other words, Yes, there's, there's certain random historic events around us and uh, triggers that produce crises. But the point is these are accidental events reflect underlying contradictions and processes in the objective material world. Laws, underlying laws and dynamics that we need to uncover. That is the role of Marxism, is to undercover, uncover and understand these laws. Because it's only in doing so, Engels highlights, that we can obtain true freedom. Engels remarks that, you know, if we, we cannot be independent of the natural and social laws that objectively exist around us, you know, we can, but we can know these laws, we can discover these laws for ourselves and make them work in our interest and, and manipulate the, the world around us to suit our ends. A good example, like I cannot imagine myself to fly and to be a bird that can jump out the window and fly away. But what I can do is by understanding physics, gravity, the laws of motion, aerodynamics, I can discover and create machines like uh, aeroplanes, drones, helicopters that can fly and can seemingly defy these uh, laws, but in fact are, are utilizing the laws and manipulating them to our advantage. And in the same way, it's up to us to uncover the mysteries and the mysterious laws of capitalism, which operate behind the backs of humans and individuals, including the capitalists themselves. We need to uncover the laws of capitalism so that we can fundamentally replace them with a new set of economic laws based on socialist planning, nationalization and workers' control. Only in this way, Engels points out in his writings, can we leap from the kingdom of necess necessity to the kingdom of freedom, that is, to the true liberation of humanity. So I think, to sum up, really, it's thanks to Engels that we have the weapons, the ideological tools, the weapons we need to wage this struggle for genuine human emancipation, for genuine liberty and freedom, and that is why we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to Engels. And so I'd just like to finish by uh, raising a toast, really. If I had a glass, I'd raise it to Engels and wish him a happy birthday. And I hope everyone at home will do the same. Wish you happy 200th birthday, Engels. Thank you very much.